Where do they come from? Why do they come? What did you see from that cockpit? An extraterrestrial spacecraft. National resources are exhausted. We must come to Earth to survive. No one to see you again. So the first live action series I made was UFO and it was made at Pinewood Studios and I remember for me personally the excitement of being actually able to walk into a set. I mean before I couldn't get your fist in the set but now actually walk in and I, I remember thinking isn't it wonderful you know the actors speak and they mouth moves dead in sync with the dialogue. <laughs> there are no wires and they walk very well as well. You know, it's, it was a whole new world and all our technical problems really had come to an end. There were other problems that took their place, but it was amazingly good fun. I had come to the con conclusion about uh, filmmaking. One was, I always felt that making a film was rather like going to war. I mean, it's that, it, it really is that difficult. If you're in a tight spot, it's great to have people who not, not only can do the job, but people who can, uh, who really care and who will, will really stick by you and, and, and really work with you well. Ed fell into that category. And again, I say this quite sincerely, not simply because Ed is sitting next to me. Ed was one of the few in his profession that I felt was totally, but totally genuine. And we were going into our first television film um, series involving people instead of puppets. I knew that everybody was going to look and see what kind of a mess we made of it. Um, we were under, under a microscope, so to speak. I didn't know at the time UFO was the first live action series. I know he'd done a lot of other, he did the puppet, all the puppet things, didn't he? Um, no, I didn't. I mean, considering he'd done shows with non-human beings, he, he was brilliant at, I mean, the cast he used to get in UFO, it was amazing. And there was quite a lot of work around at that time. I was, definitely, that it was the first time he'd used humans, if you can call us actors humans. And uh, yes, I was, so it was rather uh, an interesting situation. There's the signal. It looks good. I have a radar sighting, bearing 279. Right. This was one of the first really quite serious numbers I'd had. So the combination of it being a first for Jerry Anderson as well was quite a nice, uh, nice thing to know. It's an odd thing to say, but Ed, when Ed Bishop and I got notes about not being too animated, you, you really did feel as though maybe you know, somebody who should be working, working your strings. Um, but I did know it was his first action movie. I thought, I thought it was very, I thought it was at, of his age and, you know, the technical side of it, I thought they did very well. Very excited because as we, we sort of worked to this. We didn't start uh, back in the late 50s wanting to make public films and you have explained how we fell into that, really which we were grateful at the time, and it was a very good grounding for us all, you know. It was still, we shot on film, which was incredible, not tape. 
So, but we felt now at last we're here, we've arrived, you know. It was good to do it because now it was doing live action that we wanted. And again, I, I treated it really, um, the costumes and the, the casting, as, as if I was dealing with the puppets in a way. But now we're not a big fish in a small pool. We're a small fish in a big pool. So we're no longer doing something innovative, really. But nevertheless, it's what we always wanted to do. So I enjoyed it. Yes, it was good. So it was a big, expensive deal, you know, there's a lot of, lot of money riding on it, so it, it had to be good. You had to sort of uh, really uh, try your best, you know, as, uh, filming costs so much money. Well, it's certainly still paying off, you're going to do, show it all over again. You're showing the whole lot? But it's being released on, on Blu-ray. On Blu-ray, yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's, I don't know how many episodes they did. I, 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 as I say, I didn't... Uh, 26. 26? Oh, well, quite a lot then. Well, I had a little baby daughter too at that time. And um, she, what, in 1970, she would have been about eight. And that's why I think she grew up with the puppets. I mean, she grew up with Captain Scarlet and, and I mean, and, and Lady Penelope. I mean, that was... You know, those were the sort of people I thought we were aiming it at, really. It Well, maybe teenagers. But no, I mean, I thought those, they were, there's never been anything like it before. It was totally original. And the, and the, the models and the puppets were just wonderful. I mean, you believed, you believed those puppets, you believed their characters and what they were saying. Oh, Captain Scarlet, he was my hero. We'd all grown up, I think, well, not grown up, but, you know, Thunderbirds. It was fab. I don't think anyone knew that it would be the success that it was and is and still loved all these years later because there's so much television then, but I suppose because he had such a fantastic imagination and, and, and equipment to do this, it was, it was a great thing to be part of and I was very lucky to be in at least one episode. Uh, about Thunderbirds? Yeah. Oh, Thunderbirds was wonderful. It was like a family. It's just... It was wonderful, except Jerry. <laughs> Jerry had a very wicked sense of humor, because I played did the voice of Alan, right? And every time he saw me, he'd say, oh, huh. John, he played John up in the space station. I went, no, he played Alan, Thunderbird 3. Oh, he did all that. He was very, very bad, wicked sense of humor. I think his son has got it as well, by the way, so be very careful. But you no, know, Thunderbirds was absolutely fantastic, uh, and it took off. Wow! And for the first time, I mean, the only person anybody who knew who did voices was Mel Blanc. You know, you know, I don't know what that thought. And um, so suddenly we get these phone calls. They want to know about the voices, and it was wonderful. You know, it raised my fee for everything else. I'll tell you like that you know and so we it came a family and then we went back and did another 16 I think and then we did two movies it was wonderful well I've been in Canada for years and uh, I was working a lot in radio in Canada and so it was very familiar to me Peter Dinley was the same he was dad he had, I think he'd gone to Canada with the Air Force during the war, something like that. Originally English, but he'd, 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 he'd been there a long, long time. So he was, he was our dad. I think he used to do the thing, Thunderbirds are go, too. <laughs> Thunderbirds are go. For Jerry, yeah, I, I, I didn't even know about Thunderbirds. And as a matter of fact, a matter of fact I didn't know about Jerry Anderson. I, I had arrived from Canada. Uh, for just a couple of weeks. So uh, anyway, I didn't know about the series or what it was all about. I thought maybe it might be a week's work, so I went back to uh, to London. And I got a call, a call, a phone call, about two weeks later, offering me the part of Scott Tracy. 
I almost said, who's Scott Tracy? But I didn't. I restrained myself. <laughs> because, uh, and so there it was. That was the start. And uh, we didn't know too much about the series. We certainly didn't think it was going to end up the way it actually did. Uh, but I got to know that Jerry knew what he wanted, and he usually got it, one way or the other. Um, and so uh, gradually you got to know the other people in the, uh, in the cast. They were a good bunch, all of them good, good voice people, good voice men. Uh, and so all in all, it was a very pleasant and uh, a look forward to series, and it worked. Position, Captain. IGR 140288. Right. Take up eight fathoms. Prepare surface stations. Low tanks one through six. Yes, sir. Yes, I think I was. I, well, was I mean, aware. originally he'd done, he was editing, wasn't he? Doing a lot of si sound editing in films, so that, I think he always wanted to move into that, you know, yes. definitely. Decided and, um, not to use puppets anymore. Jerry decided, let's do humans. Well, they had I no think. plans to use puppets to start with. It just came along, so they grabbed the opportunity. Quite right. I think the support that they got, you know, was marvelous. They got very well, he got very well supported. Well, first of all, I, I, you know, I think you have to understand that certainly I was in a pole position in the production company, but the money was being provided by Associated Television, which was headed by Lord Grade, who uh, at the time was one of the greatest impresarios in British show business. And because American distribution was so important, because uh, a large slug of the production fund used to be recouped from the States. Um, the pictures used to go out to New York and we used to get feedback, um, some of which we didn't like, but nevertheless uh, we had to um, obey those who had to be ob obeyed. Oh, stop it! Stop it! Stop it! <coughs> All right, cut it. Well, I've heard of method acting, but you take the coconut. Oh, I love Jerry. I thought he was a wonderful, wonderful, caring man. He was so detailed. I'm very OCD, and he cared about everything. He could walk on the set and say to me, who did your hair today? He would know if I'd had a different hairdresser. He knew everything about everyone. He was old school about making movies or TV. He cared about every single detail. It was all important to him. It didn't matter if there was an extra that came in. He knew if the costumes were right, if this was wrong. He was great to work with. He cared. He was like Big Brother. He sat up in his office and he wanted us all to look as beautiful as we possibly could. And I don't know, I used to laugh. I used to say to him, Jerry, we haven't got strings anymore. I said, when I move, when I frown, I make lines and my hair moves. And he said, well, try to be cooler, he said to me once. I, my fa face can be very mobile, I know. And it was quite difficult holding oneself back, being very, very cool. He hated it if you went, you, your brows all furrowed or... He loved, he loved it, he wanted you to be cool. But he watched from afar. I mean, he didn't come on the floor very often. It, I mean, now when you film, I mean, the monitor's right there and your directors and your producers are standing, you know, within a yard of you. But now, uh, then, I mean, I don't know what... Jerry had a monitor up in his office and he very rarely came on the floor unless he had something really... Seriously, he wanted to say to everyone. 
He kept his distance. He was cool. Jerry was cool. Jerry tried to kill me. And I was in the episode called Exposed. I played the co-pilot. And Jerry tried to kill me in this. He really did. What happened was uh, the plane crashed. The plane had to crash, you see. So they fixed up this other cockpit. And they were going to put me in it. And they had a camera in front and this big tube. And I said, what's that for? He said, because we're shooting air on it so that when you crash, it'll go in a G-force, whatever they call it. So I said, fine, oh, okay, fine. He said, now what we're going to do, because it was on a chain, he said, we're going to take you up to the top of the studio and we're going to drop you. I went, oh, right, okay. Now that was too quick for me to think, shouldn't a stuntman be doing this? <laughs> Anyway, knowing Jerry, anyway, I got in the thing and they wheeled me up, went all the way up to the top of this. Can I swear? No. Uh, the dang thing up here, all the way to the top. And uh, they said, action. The camera went up. Anyway. And they dropped me. all the way down. And Jerry said, we didn't hear the line. And I went, what? He said, we didn't hear the line. I said, oh, oh, oh. So they wheeled me all the way back up again. And the camera went on and the and they wheeled and I went <laughs> Got down. And I went, oh, and Jerry said, we still didn't get the line. I went, oh, and up the way to the top again. Action. They said action in those days. And action. <laughs> Matt, we still didn't get the line. I said, you're not getting it. I'm not going back up there again. So that was it. So they had to, we had to redub it. I wasn't available. I was on tour with the show. Yes, I do do other work. And they phoned my agent and said, we have to come in and redo the line. And said, Matt's not available. Well, when is he? He's not. He's on tour with John Hansen. With John Hansen. And uh, he was not available. So they dubbed my voice. Jamie Wilkins, God damn him, dubbed my voice. Course steady at 014. Airspeed 2185 knots. <laughs> so the first time I was on screen... It wasn't my voice. Good man, Jerry. I mean, I wish there were more producers like him around now. He had a marvelous obituary. I mean, they, he was he was hands on, but he wasn't um, he wasn't a dictator. He, he was a very avuncular sort of person, as I found. I mean, some people, um, I, I suppose, uh, other producers were a bit jealous of him because he had quite a successful career. There weren't any problems at all. I mean, with Jerry, was such a such a good. Um, organizer of everything and he, he trusted people whereas in you know society nowadays you get somebody at the top and they can't delegate responsibility jerry did not tough to make friends with but it took a while for him to warm up and you to respond to it i don't think anybody who didn't know human beings pretty well could populate his series with such good uh, uh talent. They might have been absolute crooks, but you knew what they were. Or they might have been heroes, and you certainly knew what they were. He knew how to uh, make, his, make his pictures bite. You, you remembered his characters quite a lot. Uh, Jerry, by the time you did Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons, you'd done so many programmes, you'd kind of built up a, a fairly impressive stable of voice artists. So what was it that attracted you to Ed to do the voice for Captain Blue? Price. 
<laughs> he was so affordable. <laughs> right. I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me. Hmm? But I was so intrigued with your picture that I nearly forgot I have an appointment to meet the backer of our next uh, film, and I'm already very late. No, I quite understand, Mr. Straker. You have a very good film there. Thank you, Mr. Straker. Ed Bishop was a very charming person and he was a wonderful leading man because he always went around everybody, the whole cast, and asked how they were each morning. And um, he made me feel really a part of it because, as I said, he, he when you join a series halfway through, you feel like an outsider, but he never made me feel like that. The deposits on your knife indicate that the substance from which the undersea construction is made is of a molecular structure unknown to us. But my conclusion is that the entrance could be made by pressure. The rupture would be self-sealing. Thank you, Colonel. I hope the answer is satisfactory, sir. Colonel Lake. Look, I do understand the problems. And the answers are satisfactory. Thank you, sir. Will you please ask Colonel Foster to get his bags packed? I think the dialogue sometimes made us look as though we were, we were actually... Getting quite close. I think I remember having letters afterwards from the fans saying, "Do you think you and Ed Bishop had a romance?" And um, and we certainly did not. But I mean, I it would have been nice, actually, for them to have shown just a little bit more because he was he had very good eyes, Ed. He was very flirty eyes, and I think um, they could have developed something there very well. I think. I think I'm looking back on it. I remember us looking at each other in quite a sparky way. I wonder if that would, they did that to give it a will they or won't they. It seemed extraordinary that, it would, that actually would, that relationship wouldn't go anywhere. It wasn't totally businesslike, was it, actually looking back? Maybe we'll find out some answers when we get back to the control room. Are you OK? Fine. Well, let's go. Ed Bishop was the nicest leading man I have ever worked with. He was thoughtful, kind, um, didn't have any ego, and he stayed at Elstree Studios um, during the week all the time to shoot. This was not where his home was. And my family, I was living with my parents then, uh, didn't live too far away. And he would sometimes come to my parents' home and have dinner. So he would not always be in a hotel and have to go to restaurants. And I mean, he was a very, very successful man at that time. Very undemanding. Very, very good to me. Ed Bishop, Commander Straker. Ed and I had a, had, a, had a long career together, not, not uh, in each other's pockets, but when they wanted an American voice, a well-traveled American voice, uh, Ed and I would get the call. He was, uh, to my mind, a, a great actor, a fine actor, and a great traveling companion. Ed was um, quite serious. Um, he didn't look the way he looked on the screen now for us later on, because I went to work on him, really, basically, um, because he was uh, rather <coughs> conservatively dressed when I knew him, quiet, didn't want to be recognized, just did his job and went home. Um, so when it came to featuring him uh, in uh, UFO, um, I thought, yeah, he's got the right voice and he's got the right accent, he's American, right accent, and I think he's got the right delivery, but we'll have to do something about his looks, you know. So that's when I um, got, went to the wig makers and got a blonde wig, which horrified him because he looked like someone in drag, and then I, I had the hair styled while I was there at the wig makers. And he, I could see he was quite horrified, the whole thing, and then we put some tan makeup on him, which brought out his eyes and everything. And he was, had a good figure and everything, so we put him in uh, the uh, futuristic outfits. And he, there he was. He was great.
And I had the luxury of someone that I'd already worked with, knew that he could do all the voice thing and acting, I know he was an act, good actor, and made him into the image of the puppet. So um, that worked really well. And when I saw Ed Bishop on the set, because I was at school with Ed, I knew him as George, but that's his real name, George Bishop. I first saw Ed on the set, and I, we were chatting, but his son, he said, because they made him wear a wig, he said to me, what do you think of the wig? I said, you look like a puppet. Maybe that's what Jerry wanted, I don't know. But he did, he looked like a puppet. Now, there was another one that tried to kill me. Now, because we were in school, right? At the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. God help me. And where they tried to teach you to act. <coughs> and um, we were doing Othello. And he was playing Othello. And I played Iago. It's a nice evil part. Yes. And uh, the scene is he's choking Iago. Oh, the foul thing, blah, blah, something. And uh, then I have a big speech after that. Well, in rehearsal, it was fine. We got on stage, and he grabs me, and he thumbs goes right into my throat. You see, and I'm thinking, it's joking. He's going, foul monster. All this is going on. So I thought, I've got to get his hands away. I tried to move my hand. I was, like, paralyzed. I couldn't get... I thought... I'm going to die. How do I get out of this? So the only thing I could think of was to fall. So I, I fell. And, of course, he let go. So then he finished his speech. I got up and I went, Thou green-eyed monster. <laughs> I told him to sound like I've been dead. So cut off stage and he tells me, Oh, bloody dramatic. He said, oh, he said, they had a deeper voice. Bloody dramatic. What was the matter with you without falling around and carrying on like that? We never did that in rehearsal. I said... George, you were choking me. He went, what? I said, you were choking me. I was going to die, you know. It's just, you really, uh, he went, oh, sorry about that. Do I have to talk any, uh, you know, you're I'll, just sitting there I'll, listening. I'll, 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 I'll say this. What was funny? Everything about it. All of it? All yeah. of it. Oh. This is going to be, we're going to have to give you a program on your own. <laughs> yeah, he's falling asleep behind That's the camera. The well, I think one thought it was for a younger audience, but I think I think what was so obviously good about it was the fact that actually it was that bit more sophisticated, obviously from the puppets. Parents obviously liked it too. Suddenly it wasn't just for, for, for children. And... What happened? You passed out for a few minutes and they saw the bath. A few minutes? They drink this. Tell me, Colonel, have you been uh, burning the candle at both ends recently? Well, there was a party last night. Well, in, in America, it was top rated. And I, I think it, it had a very mature audience. No! Even, even, uh, not children's hour, it was too, too advanced for children's hour, but I'd uh, really rather where the soaps go now, round about that slot. C certainly no later than nine o'clock, I'd have thought. But I think the stories, again, were good. Jerry made sure of that. They, 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 those stories would have an impact. Uh, and they did, and um, I think that's why it rated so highly over there. But the, uh, it, it certainly, it certainly proved its worth over there in America. That's a tough market. 
a lot of it's lousy, but I mean the uh, the uh, the good stuff is very good. It must have something, otherwise I don't think we'd still be talking about it today. Hello, I'm Deborah Grant, and I played Linda Simmons in the Psycho Bombs episode. No, it was day for night, as you can see if you look carefully. There's quite a lot of daylight there. I was being dragged along behind a lorry, uh, which was... Um, I suppose the car must have been on some sort of truck, uh, because I couldn't drive. I do remember being told off by one of the producers at the time because I couldn't drive. He said, call yourself an actress. So I rushed off and got driving lessons once the thing was over. Um, I suppose a sort of short tracy of psycho bombs. I'd woken in the night and was drawn ineluctably to the nearby woods where I met up with Mike Pratt, who was also influenced by the uh, thing, and Deborah Grant, who was, I think, sort of driving a car or something, and then she was, we were all drawn to this UFO, like a sort of crystal thing in, in the woods, and it took us over and gave us enormous powers and strength. Psycho bombs. We were assigned to attack different locations. I was going to. They wanted me to uh, destroy this secret location, this uh, MOD or whatever it was. But of course, British pluck <laughs> saw them off at the end. <laughs> One of the great fun parts of this part, um, first of all, Gavin, who I knew from drama school, um, <laughs> went down rather swiftly with one hand. And then later, when I get to Shadow, I presume, um, I'm throwing people around and they were all stunt guys. And I just walk into the room and touch them and they all back flip away out of shot. It's brilliant. The worst of it was the, the very end when I'm electrocuted instead of blowing up. <laughs> us an ultimatum. We had rehearsed this with these huge chords that I was to press together and when you're electrocuted you stick presumably and you stay there. Miss Simmons! If you touch those cables Surrender. They hadn't told me that there were going to be fireworks coming out. And when we went for the take, I pushed things together and... Ah! Ah! Emergency circuits. Linda. The whole thing exploded in my hands. And I flew off backwards and lay on the floor and they did all the rest of it. And I was mortified because that was not what should have happened. I should have stayed there, stuck to this thing. I was taken off to first aid with burnt hands. 
um, simply because they hadn't bothered to tell me what was going to happen. And I was so cross because I wanted to do, do it again. I said, That's, we didn't do it properly. But they, they couldn't, obviously, they couldn't go through it again. So, but, uh, I certainly didn't get a shock from it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't actually electricity coursing through it. Walking! I think it looked all right, but uh, uh, you just had to act. I think that's when I died, wasn't it? And every, everyone breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> I have to leave. I don't understand. Is anything wrong? I must go at once. You don't feel, feel well. Come and sit down. No! No, I think it was sugar. Somebody told me it was sugar <laughs> or something. A lovely old 70s telephone, isn't it? So I think they had maybe two. <laughs> don't go for it until we do a take, you know. Otherwise we're sunk because we've only got one spare. Oh, yes, yes. That was a sort of night late evening night shoot and they'd spent was it sort of wire mesh fencing and they had very carefully cut a big hole in it you know and then sewn it together i was been overtaken by a the UFO and I'd become a psycho bomb, I suppose you call it. And I had to go up and just slice through the fence and then rip it apart and step through. It's getting ready, like people behind the camera, and they were saying, and they were talking, and the director was behind the camera. And then someone mentioned, someone just said, well, and then action. <laughs> So I did. I started acting. Uh, and I attacked the fence, ripped it open. And they said, no, no, we're not ready to go yet. <laughs> and it took them over an hour to put the fence back together again. So we could do the shot. It was hot and sunny and he was lovely. Um, there is a terrible shot where he swings me round and the skirt goes up and there's a pair of tights, <laughs> what I would now call big pants, but that's what we wore in those days. And I can't imagine why it wasn't edited out, but it's been pointed out to me by so many people and it makes me cringe. <laughs> but there we are. <laughs> I remember having my hair bleached every day in makeup to keep the blonde so that there wouldn't be any roots coming through. They made me look extraordinary. Don't you, Paul? Don't you, Paul? He's what? And that slow blinking, I remember I had to blink very, very slowly, but it was still cranked so that it was even slower. Um, I've always been able to cry, so I don't think that was a problem, but I think they did have to paint tears on because the whole thing was being done in such slow-mo. <laughs> Was do you think there's a reason? Do you think you've got a science fiction face? Um, no. I'd like to congratulate you and your team, Herr Mahler. This looks like the breakthrough we've been waiting for. Oh, not my team, Colonel. May I introduce our chief designer, Virginia Lake? How do you do, Colonel? I played Colonel Virginia Lake in UFO, and um, I was lucky enough to do several episodes, and I. I thought the, the title was rather splendid. I loved being Colonel Virginia Lake amongst a lot of very hunky men. Answer to question one. From Anderson's psychiatric report, I can find no reason for disloyalty. 
I tell you, it was so difficult reading off a computer. And I'm appalled when I listen to it, when I, I sound like Lady Kensington, and I thought that simply wouldn't pass now. It's terribly far back. Answer to question two, as you insist upon asking questions without giving sufficient information, I can only supply unsatisfactory answers. The most I can say about the last question, is there any link between the undersea dome and the massing of UFOs in area NML12, is, if there is any link, it can only be connected with my previous answers. I mean, they just come out, and they weren't, they weren't printed, and I had to learn a lot of it, because it, the print would come out so fast that I, I couldn't keep up with the dialogue. It was quite, it was very tricky. <laughs> well, I thought I hoped I, I that came across, did it? That I was reading it. You were convincing. Yeah. Oh, good. See, it is there to bring about in some way the non-function of shadow to allow the UFO's uninterrupted entrance to Earth's atmosphere. Hmm. Well, that's a mass of useless information. Yes, I agree. It's extraordinary. The only thing I remember about that episode was that I had huge hair. And I know when I went back and I then officially got the job, I said, do I have to have my hair as big as that? And, and, and the hairdresser, Alice Head, said, no, we'll work something out. But I really almost didn't do it because I, I didn't want to appear with that huge puffball head. Look, don't worry. It'll be OK. Anyway, we have a dinner date. I wouldn't let anything interfere with that. Thank you. I, I remember watching an episode of it much later on and um, Ed was looking, of course, very serious because the UFOs were shooting from us from above. And I'm sitting there looking as cool as a cucumber as if nobody was there. I was rather ashamed of myself, actually. <laughs> I thought, you're not reacting, Wanda. You're just sitting there looking cool. But I, I seemed to be totally unaware that we were being chased. I don't know who directed that episode, but they should have said, pull your socks up. Come on, come on. Well, I'm Sue Jameson, and I played Anne Stone. I think it was called The Sound of Silence, if I remember rightly. I'm Michael Jaston, and my role was Russell Stone, and the episode was called The Sound of Silence. I was in it with... Um, Susan Jameson was in it. Good boy. What kept you? You cheated. <laughs> I did not! Uh, Michael Jaston, I'm very fond of Michael. I've known him for years. My, well, Michael was playing a top show jumper, and I was playing his sister. And um, I'd ridden quite a bit. And I'd ridden uh, for Reg Dent before, who was the horse wrangler who was brilliant. Real great horsey guy. He was super. Um, and we had two nice horses. Uh, Michael had a grey horse called Bluey, I think. And I had a little chestnut called Viking. And she was an expert rider. I, I had to have a, a stuntman for some of the jumps because I, I did one jump, but uh, on this fantastic horse called Bluey. And I found out, unfortunately, I met the stuntman about three or four months later and poor old Bluey had broken his neck and had to be destroyed about three months later, which was rather sad. But I remember Susan Jameson, an expert horsewoman, but the horse went one way, there was a tree there, and the horse went one way and she came off and she was quite badly bruised, but she was a trooper and, and carried on. Unfortunately, Reg hadn't told me that Viking was specially trained to run straight towards trees in order to cause the drama. Uh, and then he would duck to the left. Uh, he forgot to mention that he ducked left. And when Viking careered straight towards this rather large tree, I pulled him to the right and we parted company. <laughs> <laughs> Idiot! And as I was the one who was supposed to be the rider out of the two of us, 
Michael had ridden a little bit. He'd been in Cromwell sitting on a horse behind Albert Finney in a film. Um, but I was supposed to be the big rider, so luckily I wasn't injured, except that my, uh, my pride was dented. <laughs> so I always remember that. After that, I just let Viking do whatever he wanted because I knew he knew better than me. We had a great big field because I remember uh, the stunt guy said, Bluey's going back to the um, stables now and you'd better really cling on for life because he wants to go home and, and get fed. Pa? Over here! Richard Vernon played our dad and I thought he was adorable. And, and he was such a funny man. Uh, we had to um, sometimes retake things because we were starting to laugh at him. He was a superb actor. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I loved him, actually. I thought he was gorgeous. And uh, being quite young and all the rest of it, I particularly liked um, chaps who were just a little bit older. Not romantically, I don't mean, but just in their company. And so I thought perhaps the best thing to do would be if he would marry me. So I asked him every day. Uh, and uh, he said no. For some reason he thought that already being married was a, a hindrance, I don't know why. Could have married me as well, I thought. No, he was lovely, we loved him. And uh, of course, Ed Bishop, who I didn't really get to know on that because I didn't have many scenes with him, I didn't have any scenes with him. But I knew Ed in the power game, hundreds of years ago now. Um, no, the skydiver set that we worked on was quite small, quite contained, if I remember correctly. I don't suppose much bigger than this. Yes, that's right. This green expanse here. I mean, quite Something small. like that. It's quite small, but it was all, you know, the workings of a submarine. The, the commander has all these things that he does, and he has a periscope and all that sort of stuff. And uh, so there was a lot... A lot of controls in it. Left off stations. Yes, sir. Good luck. I remember when I arrived for the first days filming all these little knobs and computer things and switches, and that's slightly intimidating. But one um, just went into it and uh, pressed, one hoped, the right knobs. I hope nobody has ever really tried to work out what the knobs were or whether I was pressing the right ones. No, I did. Uh, I always you pressed did. the one I was told to do, yes, didn't well, you? Yes, you probably... Yes, I tried to. <laughs> I tried to in my, in, my, in my way. There were so many knobs and things. It, it was. was um, it was a very complicated thing to be in, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It had its moments, I must say. Yes. Um, and with my knowledge of um, flying anything, is uh, it was... <laughs> It was quite interesting. Oh, you fly but, planes? But no, that's what I mean. Oh, I see. I, I don't <laughs> do anything like that. <laughs> no, I don't think the skydiver ever had a nasty accident or anything because of anything that I pressed. <laughs> Any button that suddenly went wrong. No. Because I was, the, uh, I think, the only lady at that particular, in, in those particular scenes. It, I don't remember any, I, I was delighted because all these lovely... You were an innocent at large. Yes, I was an innocent I too. know. But it was lovely with all these very good looking men around me. <laughs> wow. You know, it was, it was very wow. enjoyable. And, and very, um, I remember it being very relaxed and, and uh, yes, everybody it, seemed to gel very well together. It actually was very easy to do mm. that. Yeah. Wasn't it? Cut boosters. Age circuits okay. Cut boosters. Relays okay. But let's get back. Interlocks engaged. Stabilized gyros. The wonderful hatch that Peter Gordino used to slide down. I think I had a great desire probably to have a little quick, quiet go on it, but no, I never, never did such a thing, you know. I tried to behave properly and not have a... No, no, no. I was very... Contained. All right, let's take it from the top. Over. Mark it. One, four, seven, take two. Bye, Howard. Anyway, you want. All right, General Michael. 
There was a big fight sequence in there that was very difficult to do the choreography because you're very limited for space. So the body's flying all over our heads. Yes, and when, when you're actually shooting, when you're doing that, it's very restrictive because you can only move so far because you don't have the square. It was, I don't know now, when you shoot a series, there is tremendous pressure and there's a lot of corporation stuff behind it. There was a great atmosphere on that set every single day. Yes, we were pressured because it was expensive and you had to get through stuff, but there was a great atmosphere. It was an extraordinary thing happened. We were a science fiction series and it was so futuristic, our costumes, everything. And then they landed on the moon during the time that we were there. And it almost felt like we've gone from sci-fi to a soap. It's extraordinary. It's, it, I mean, everything we said about the moon, and here it was. We all watched it in the studio between the takes. It was amazing. There's an episode where you're playing a, a kind of an alien double of yourself and you're sort of miming to your own voice using a tape recorder. Can you remember that? Shadow control to moon base. Come in, moon base. Moon base receiving you, shadow control. UFOs approaching from NML 12. Do not attempt to intercept. Repeat, do not attempt to intercept. Do not understand. Do not understand. You say do not intercept. Is this correct? Correct. Commander Straker's orders. UFOs to be dealt with by Earth's defences. Over and out. No. Oh. <laughs> I don't remember that. Have you got a clip of it? Yeah. I'd love either. to see it. <laughs> I don't remember that. You're sort of miming that's... to your own voice. Wow. Well, that's okay, because I was a singer. We mimed everything in those days. <laughs> but you're slightly out of sync, deliberately. So that I look like I'm fake. Well, there you go. It's acting. How about that? <laughs> then there was an episode where you're, uh, they've, they've got a cat that's possessed by, the, by an alien. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those at home, yes. I mean, cats are notoriously difficult to train. I was never with the cat. Was the cat near me? What are you doing here? I should report you, you know. This is a restricted area. Looks like we got ourselves a massacre. Oh my word. I don't remember the cat. I don't remember the cat or the miming. You better get me now because I'm losing it fast. <laughs> I don't remember the cat. Makeup? No, no. So the first thing we'll ask you is to introduce my you. name. Yeah, yes. Okay. <coughs> so you are. I'm Matt Zimmerman. Hello, my name is Matt Zimmerman. I was in the episode called Exposed, <laughs> uh, playing Jim the pilot, the co-pilot actually. I was the co-pilot, wasn't I? And it was very interesting because uh, I, are we on? Yeah. We're on. Start, yeah. could, could, somebody could have said action. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Action. Okay. Yes. Hello. My name is Matt Zimmerman, and I was in UFO. That that, that, that. Well, I'm gonna find my agent when I leave here. You realize? Yeah. So, so. That's he always wear those shorts. Especially for today because oh, very to nice. Off. Yes, yes. Do you think do you, am I too close to this? So tell us, uh, Matt. Matt. Obviously, in the episode. I was only there one day. What do you want? What do you want? Blood. I was, blood. Blood. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I thought. I saw the episodes. I mean, I thought that you have. I, what I thought was brilliant, right? Uh, which was Jerry again, it was fantastic, was the way he blended the real people with the, with the sort of miniatures and things. That's brilliant. 
Range 480 yards. Angle 0, decimal 28. Not too close. Try another one, as close as you dare. Yes, sir. My name is Alan Shoebrook and I was working as a model maker on the UFO series. Slightly different from model making in other studios where the model making department would be probably um, some distance perhaps from the studios itself. Um, the model making department was actually adjoined to three major special effects studios. So at any one time you'd be making a model and then going in and helping in the studios as well. So it's a bit of a combination of a special effects technician and a model making. And of course, as model making, everybody assumes that you're going to be making flying saucers and spaceships all the time. Whereas in reality, you were asked to make anything that was going to appear on the screen, be it a piece of fencing, um, a sign, a bit of roadway dressing. It was all anything that was required came from the model shop. So you know, the day was quite varied in what was actually being produced. Plastic kits always played a major, major part in, in every single building, craft that, that were produced on the, on the sets. Um, right from the early days, I can remember going over to the Airfix factory with Derek Meddings in, in Woolwich, and um, we went in and they brought out all these wonderful galleons and, and things that they had been producing, didn't know what we wanted at all. And we'd look around the, the, the kits and we'd see special kits, all sorts of kits, hovercrafts with parts inside them that we knew that once you stuck that on top of that and turned it upside down and sprayed it silver, it would look quite special. So we'd say we'd have 200 of those and 200, and they looked at, at us with absolute amazement, didn't know what on earth we were doing, you know. Um, it was exactly, exactly the same when we went into hardware shops. We'd find sort of um, weird looking egg cups and we'd want 20 of them and the checkout assistant would always look at us as if we were mad, but we knew what we wanted to do with them because they'd all be stuck on top of a building upside down and something else put on top of that and that would make the set. So you're always trying to look outside the box. I mean, Derek Meddings told, taught everybody in special effects to, to not just look at what you're looking at, but imagine it turned upside down, inside out, whatever. Um, and I still do that. I still can't walk into a shop today without thinking, my, that would make a lovely rocket if we turned that upside down and did something with it. But um, that, that was the magic that Derek sort of put into everybody. Um, so when you were making buildings, you were using anything you could. The kits were lovely because they had lovely fine parts in them, but we'd be using fiberglass, we'd be using um, polystyrene, um, and, and obviously balsa wood and things like that, depending what the vehicle had to do. So, yeah, it was quite a combination of, um, of different materials for, for, for the model making department. On the UFO series, probably I suppose the most important thing that I worked on was making the actual moon base um, itself. We had two moon base constructions. One was a very large scale and one was, was quite small. The largest scale um, was quite enormous and um, I mean it probably took 15 feet by 15 feet of, of sort of studio space plus all the dressing around it. Whereas the miniature one was only a sort of a, those spheres were only probably about six, seven inches sort of um, wide. We had the miniature one so that we could do long shots, get up high in the studio, and it looked as if we were really approaching the moon base from a very, very high sort of a, um, angle. Whereas with the large one, we were going in really close, so the detail of dressing and, and what went on to the buildings itself was quite important. You'd see the camera suddenly zoom in at, at uh, rushes that we were watching, and uh, you'd hope that the cut would come before it went too close because you knew that your biro marks or whatever you'd stuck on there was probably going to show up for exactly what it was, whereas from a distance everything worked perfectly. You four at 12 o'clock, you are the target. But of course all the other vehicles, the, the incredible UFOs themselves, I mean they were quite a work of art in that somebody had to come up with an idea how, how you could have a flying saucer spinning at speed towards you when in fact it was on four wires that couldn't possibly tangle up. So Derek came up with this, uh, Derek Meddings came up with this brilliant sort of conception of producing a, a perspex dome um, that was suspended with the four wires and then from underneath that he put a um, motor that then had another dome with paddles sort of on it and the, the lower dome spun at high speed 
with the motor, whereas the perspex dome on top was being held by the, the four wires and never moved at all. But of course, when the vehicle was travelling, you saw straight through that perspex dome and you just saw the rotating um, uh, dome inside it. Um, but of course, it was always wobbling. It was a bit like sort of trying to balance a car wheel. It was never quite sort of right unless you got the, the, the lead weights, and in our case, pieces of plasticine in the right place. It was quite the difficult vehicle to actually sort of fly. Um, and of course, every time it fle fell off its wires, the paddles would all break off and, um, you know, back into the studio and you were on sort of seconds and seconds of time to try and produce something quickly to repair it before so they could carry on filming, really. So. Yeah, I, I actually worked and built the Rolls-Royce. It was originally cast and made in just wood, but once the whole Rolls-Royce was finished, then I took um, silver foil, just normal cooking foil, and um, moulded it over the top of the um, front section, whole section of the Rolls-Royce. It's obviously all sprayed up, and then the front section of the Rolls-Royce that was wood, I then cut away, and stuck on the foil section, um, so that the whole of the front of that Rolls-Royce was completely floppy, other than the, the, the rigging underneath holding the wheels. And then, of course, on action, the, the Rolls-Royce would come crashing through that um, wall. The stones would all go flying off in different directions because they were literally balanced. And hopefully, for a few seconds, we'd see that crumpled Rolls-Royce frontage, which was the difference between making something look real or just a model. Shadow Mobile is obviously a brilliant design from, from Mike Trim, um, following on a design of a vehicle that we had in um, Joe 90. When we built the forest sets for the mobiles to travel through, to me, probably in all the times that I worked on the studio and the 100 plus programmes I worked on, they were some of the best special effects shots that ever came out of that studio. And they could be compared with anything anywhere in the world that you would be very, very hard to differentiate between the real thing and, and the, the shadow mobiles that were, were in that forest scene. They seem to be using some sort of... SM3, can you hear me? Come in, SM3. But the end result on screen, I mean, we tend to take a lot of things for granted when you're filming, doing every day, doing different special effects shots. But I look back now and see those shots, and I think, yeah, they are, from 1969, they are still the real thing. I don't think with explosions we ever really knew what was going to happen. Um, the worst scenario was that you were actually dealing with an explosion in the water tank. because whenever anything had to be blown up in the huge water tanks that we had in the studios, um, automatically the explosion would throw the water up into the air. 
and the whole of the studio was lined with 10 kilowatt lamps that were red hot with the toughened glass on them. But that water would splash up and virtually hit the roof of the studio. And of course, as soon as it hit the 10 kilowatt lamps, um, nine times out of 10, the glass would shatter and come down on top of you. So it wasn't just the explosion that you were actually sort of frightened of, it was what was going to happen when you mix electricity with water. Yeah, explosions were, were dangerous and we had a few accidents there. Uh, we probably didn't take as much time uh, in looking at health and safety in the 1960s as, as anybody would now. <laughs> We thought it was all just a lot of fun. Um, now I think, um, on hindsight, we probably got away with uh, a lot of explosions, a lot of dangerous things that um, perhaps um, we shouldn't have uh, shouldn't have been doing at the time. <laughs> Yeah, model making, I think, was stepped up on, on UFO so that we really did sort of try and produce the ultimate um, realism. The biggest um, transformation was that for many, many, many years in the studios, the only way of producing a vehicle um, flying was to suspend it stationary in front of a rotating canvas backdrop, um, as happened in Thunderbirds and everything else before it. Um, very simple shot to do, could be done in a very simple area. That was thrown completely out the window once uh, UFO came along and we thought, well, no, now we're, we've moved on from children's television to adult television, we've got to come up with something different. So we had a situation where we filled the whole of one of the special effects sets with um, timber boarding about a metre high to create this um, uh, trap for the dry ice smoke that we poured into that uh, particular um, gully so that the smoke couldn't uh, disappear anywhere. On top of that, then we had smoke guns and we put floating smoke above the dry ice. And then, of course, we had the situation where we actually pulled the vehicles, be they the UFOs or, or a space uh, craft, through um, the, the smoke between the two layers normally, between the dry ice that was on the, on the ground floating low uh, and the, the smoke that floated above the dry ice. We try and drag the vehicles through the middle of it. And of course, that would create moving smoke and um, a much, much more realistic shot. UFO, I think, special effects wise, I mean, more than happy with, with what we did, considering it's, it's when it was made. Um, but I think the special effects that we did in, in, in um, the end there at the series were comparable with anything that was being produced in Hollywood, if not in some cases, I would say far superior. <laughs> Can I remember much about Ed Straker's car? I think, was it a gullwing? It was a gullwing, wasn't it? So it was quite radical. And they flipped up, didn't they, like the DeLorean cars? They were very exotic looking, but they were actually very, very slow and had to be pushed, in my case, pushed into shot and pulled out of shot because I couldn't park or back up or anything sensible, useful. Jump in. Thank you very much. It was supposed to be a futuristic car. <laughs> it looked like a, a load of old um, tap when you actually got into it. It was built for its appearance rather than its comfort or its... Uh, or its mobility, very uncomfortable and a lot of sharp edges and things like that because it was a, a quick body job on, on an old, old banger, I suppose, yes. But um, it did the job. Which was wonderful. I remember there was a lot of, there was a publicity shot that went around for a long time with me in the silver moon suit, not the wig, standing by the car. And um, I, it's extraordinary. I thought, would, would that car ever happen? And it did, didn't it?
DeLorean. I remember that the 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 as the wing lids went up, I I thought, how are they going up? And it was propped up with a with props with the prop men had had very cleverly. Um, I don't know how they did it. The the wing came up, and you didn't see anyone propping it. But without a prop, it would have crashed down. They did terribly well, I think. In a couple of episodes, I, I played an alien. Not ever having met one, it was, you know, it was uh, right off the top of your head. But certainly the, uh, the uniforms and the costumes that you had to wear quickly identified who you were and what you were up to, whether you were good or bad or what you were. So uh, it, that part of it was all right, but they were very heavy. I tell you what, I could have slept in my helmet. It was so big. Uh, and I bumped into I don't know how many trees because it, the things kept on falling away from the, the visual track. And uh, one time I knocked myself out. Now, I've got asthma, which, which means that you don't like to get into tight spots. And uh, you're liable to go frantic if, if you do. But being knocked out sort of eliminated that as a, as a sort of difficulty. <laughs> Maximum security alert, operational, sir. Captain Carlin, standing by. Right. Captain Carlin? Straker. Carlin, reading you. I want you to launch Sky One for possible interception. The costumes were, I have to tell you, magnificent. I think they wanted to show all of the costumes. And though I was always uh, in shadow, one time up on the moon, a lot of stuff, even today in television, it's sort of thrown together and made to look okay on camera. These things were unbelievable off camera. The boots were leather, everything was beautifully made. That's why it doesn't look dated. If you look at any of the outfits that the girls are wearing on the moon, you could put them in a modern sci-fi series today and it would be fine. They were great, it was good. I used to have to sort of... Did you do it without a slip? No, please. I have it covered up completely. No, I, know. I, know. I think I should have had a slip. Yes, I was almost going to say, perhaps the men should have had yeah. little, little vests underneath yeah, as well. We they, should have done, shouldn't yes, we? Yes, depending on whether it was cold or hot or whatever. In their string vests, and they had the immortal line, sever ship to shore umbilicals. Sever ship to shore umbilicals. Yes, sir. Sever ship to shore umbilicals. And they couldn't say it. They could not say. They couldn't say it without giggling. Bless them. And I think Jeremy, the director, may have got a little knocked in the end. But it's a hell of a line, isn't it, to say? You try and say it. Sever ship to shore umbilicals. It's a tongue twister. <laughs> but you, you there was. They were so funny. Those things. They were marvelous idea. They really looked very, very good in the photographs. Yes. I, th I think they're very And uh, for actually, and comfortable to wear, which is nice. You well, you know they're very good if you're in a cold climate. Yes, a string vest. Skin string vest, yes, yes. you'd think all those big holes, let the cold that air in. what they're meant to be. It, no, it yeah, holds the warm air close to you. Yes, yes, good thinking. I hadn't thought about that. Yes. Yeah, in Canada we wear them all the time. Of course, <laughs> yes. Shame you didn't keep yours. Pardon? You didn't keep your string vest, though. No, I no, think it felt no. a bit... <laughs> It's as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't push me, Henderson. Jim! Look, somebody ought to take you. you. You haven't got the guts. Let's get back to realities. You're nothing but a bunch of spineless, gutless sheep. The lot of you. Nah, nah, nah. Cut! And print that. That was uh, very, very nice. Well, I think it stands up pretty well. That There is a a naivete that is in, dare I say, Doctor Who, as well as UFO. There is something about, because we are fantasizing slightly, and it's television, which is very different to movie because there's so much more special effects and outrageous things. I think it holds up really well. The, the costumes, the way that um, the people behave, does not look in any way very dated.
I think, if anything, if you look at Star Trek, sometimes the earlier ones of that can look far more dated than we are, just because of the speech patterns. I think it's because it was the first, it was the first of its kind. It really was. And I think it was very, very well made for its time. I mean, when you think now, what's available? You know, in Star Treks and things, I mean... I mean, I thought Star Trek, the first Star Treks, were actually really trashy. No, I did. The costumes, you look back at the costumes and they were all sort of loose and... I mean, we were very tailored. I thought we were rather chic by comparison. But, it, you know, if you've got an American accent in those days, it kind of glamorised. They glamorised things, you know. <laughs> don't know, my son was in the latest one. God. I suppose I really shouldn't say this, but I, for those of you who don't know, um, my son is Benedict Cumberbatch. He, he's only seen Time Lash. And, of course, because it's, it's a sort of glamorous one. I mean, they, they just sit there going, don't believe it. Oh, look at that, look, you look fantastic. I mean, and he actually, actually, tell you this funny story. Uh, we went over to watch him at one time doing the, what was it, Khan in Star Trek. He said, don't, don't go yet. He said, don't leave before I want you to meet JJ. And we hung around the set one afternoon and we waited. And um, it, Benedict had got a thing because Alice Eve was in the film and she played very similar kind of hair like that, very similar to, to Colonel Lake. And Benedict was wonderful. He said, She's, she looks fantastic, but you haven't seen my mother. And he said, he said, show me a picture of your mother. And so when I met, Ben carries this purple one, he's on his phone. And, but he never talks about it. I don't get any praise from it, but obviously he shows other people. And when I, he, he, we eventually went over and met JJ in a break, he, he shook my hand, he said, I've seen so many pictures of you. He said, I feel I own you. And I was so embarrassed. So, so, but we, the first day, um, <laughs> the first day we were, we were in, watched in the studio, they were doing a long, long tracking shot of Khan being in his capsule, being sent off to wherever. And right at the end of this long, long line, there was the bright light like this and two figures waiting for the capsule. And they took hours doing this one thing of the last shot of this, the thing, the visor, closing in on him. And I thought the first two were brilliant. They did 42. And I heard myself saying, I took four takes to get up to the moon in UFO. 42 takes it took to put a visor over. Unbelievable, when I think. When I think of what, what they achieved down there in comparison. Amazing. But I couldn't resist. It was really rather awful to say that, wasn't it? God. I was thrilled. It was so exciting, the whole thing. I mean, you think of the time this was made. We just had moon landings. We were all really excited by all this and believing it could happen. There could be flying saucers. Um, and I can remember we were actually filming at MGM and I was in my dressing room the night that they landed on the moon. And uh, I don't think any of the technology has been upstaged. Uh, but Jerry, may I ask a question? Uh, were you insured? I heard a rumor that the company was insured that should the moon landing suddenly d discover something that there, there wasn't weightlessness, let's say, for example, and you guys had to reshoot that you had a policy or something like that? Or is that just <laughs> one of those rumors that exist in the saloon bar? No, I think the only insurance that Lou Grade had in the event of me making such a mistake was that he could have fired me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think people wanted to... People still do want to believe there are UFOs and aliens and things, but I think then probably even more so than people are a bit more sophisticated now, <laughs> perhaps. But maybe there are aliens out there, who knows. Um, but I would have thought at the time it was um, a good time to be doing something about the, the UFOs and aliens and with the moon landing as well. Well, I suppose there were a lot of people were claiming to have seen UFOs, weren't they, at that time? So it was timely from that point of view. They were cashing in on a... There was a fashion for people seeing... Convince their 
seeing UFOs landing all over the place. I think at the time, UFOs and aliens were, were something that people were believing in and, and seeing on a regular basis. The, the press was full of pictures of the Loch Ness Monster and um, strange sightings. Um, we were very much hoping that something like that would would happen for real. So this must have plugged into a need. I'd like to very much. Oh, yes, I'd like that. Yes, yes. I'd, I'd like to be abducted. I'm not too sure about the probing business, but uh, you never know. I mean, he talks a good line over there, but never mind. He said something about an alien. An alien. No! They were they were good they were good very good scripts I think. In some ways, I'm surprised that UFO is is as popular as it as it as it was then. But then, uh, as I said, I was in Doctor Who with Colin Baker, and I'd never have, and that was twenty nearly thirty years ago. There's always a place for something like that, I think, as long as it's well done, and it was well done. Now, whether this was how Jerry did things or whether it was just the quality of the scripts, hinting at something else, a lot of Jerry's stuff, uh, with, the, with the shade slightly drawn. Uh, but but it, it was good television, and it was also uh, terrific to, to be able to do dialogue with a slight shade to it, so everything wasn't totally uh, obvious. When they took me on board, I was resuscitated. I have a task to complete. Where is that mechanism? Where is that missing piece? Tim. The injection will make you tell me. So I think that just the nature of, of uh, Jerry's uh, production, what he wanted and what he usually got, was this kind of innuendo feeling that you had. You're never quite sure what was what. I like that. Good for an actor. I'm, I'm just pleased I was in it because it, 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 it's still going on after all these years. The same as Doctor Who. I'm so pleased to have been in Doctor Who, although some of the scripts weren't terribly good, whereas the, I think UFO scripts generally were, were very well done, I think. I didn't understand a word of any of the scripts. <laughs> but then I don't understand anything about science fiction, really. But, um, it's been very popular. It's got this cult f following, you know, people sort of follow you about and write to you and ask for autographs and things, which is the same with the Doctor Who. It's all, they're, they're dedicated followers of it. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, Jerry and Sylvia aimed it at youngsters, the show. Um. I think if you get a really nice, witty script with good writing, it it it, it crosses the the borders, doesn't it? But uh, I suppose perhaps it was slightly aimed at children, but um, I think it reached a few more people than that. I would have thought that the strength of it is the design of it, 
and the clothes fall in love because at that time I don't think people had seen that those sort of outfits and things on real people <laughs> had the puppets in wonderful outfits but uh, suddenly humans if you can we were wearing these wonderful things and I think uh, the stories just they were good um, straightforward very very well thought up clever idea um, clever Jerry Anderson <laughs> I think one has to say. Uh, <laughs> I like that final line, well, obviously. Yeah. Yes, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> if it wasn't for him, we probably wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah, well, it does, because I, I hadn't thought about it in years and years. You know, because it hasn't been on television for years, has it? Um, I'm delighted. It's going out on... Blu-ray, is that, is that? I don't know what that means. I think it's wonderful. I can't believe, you know, it's wonderful to have done something so many, many years ago. We're still talking about it now. And that it's now coming out on Blu-ray, which I believe is going to be absolutely fascinating. What does that something. mean, it's on Blu-ray? Does it mean it's going to come out at us in a different form or what? High definition, is it not? It's high real definition. high, ah, high, ah, high ah, definition. Right, Whether sorry. all the um, wrinkles and things will come out too, I don't know. Well, hopefully not, because one was incredibly younger then, so <laughs> we should be all right with that. But um, I'm very pleased it is. I mean, I don't really know. I think, I think it is amazing how long its lifespan has been. I think it's extraordinary, and I think that kind of shows that it was pretty good, pretty well made. Of its genre, I think it's not half bad. I, I think that the U.S. for the one outstanding thing, I would think would be the professional camaraderie that we... Uh, uh, entered into in the, the making of the series for about 15, 16 months that we were together. The memory of that is uh, if, if we, we see each other or any member of the cast or the crew, there's a sort of unspoken affair, if you like, <laughs> that each of us have traversed. And uh, the memory of that is uh, with us always and will always be. What do I remember most about the series? I think, like most young people, you you know you're doing something special and you know that it's, um, it's great and you're really happy. But what I find incredible is that we can sit here all these years later and be talking about it and people want to know about it and there are... 10, 15,000 people come at a time at a convention to see the people. I think that's extraordinary. Of all the things that I've done in my life, this was not the, the biggest acting role or the most demanding. And it has brought so much pleasure to me and I think to other people. I think that's incredible. And uh, I do it all again. Jerry, you know. Well, Jerry was the chance, best kind of boss nice that you could have. <laughs> <laughs> because he, very laid back, very always in control without having to exert himself. I've never seen him uh, get angry. I've never seen him panic. I've never seen him raise his voice. Maybe he, I'm sure he does because he's a human being. But he it, it, it never did it in front of the troops. He was a, uh, an excellent, the best kind of boss you could have who, who bosses without bossing, if that makes any sense. In answer to that question, yeah, Ed's going to be on the news series. 